Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to COVID Conversations with me, Carbon H. Goldstone, where I will be trying to explain the 2019 novel coronavirus or the COVID-19 pandemic to people as simply as possible. Um, I'm not a doctor or a scientist of, of any sort, so what the way I explain it to you is the way I understand it. And if you receive different information from a professional or a scientist, uh, I would say go with that information. But the intention of this conversation is to try simplify some very complex things as I've understood it. <clears throat> so I thought maybe we'd start with South Africa. We've had our first death in the country and uh, one confirmed that initially the Department of Health issued a statement saying there were two people that died. And they've since recalled that and said that we've had one death from uh, COVID-19. And it's, it's an interesting case because the person who died is under 50 and is female, which is not in the main group that has been uh, highlighted as vulnerable to the disease. However, the report from the department said she had a pulmonary embolism, which is essentially a blood clot in the, in the lungs, and it does affect breathing. It does cause shortness of breath, uh, which, of course, COVID-19 also causes. Uh, the other case, they initially thought she had died of COVID-19 because she displayed similar symptoms. Um, I'm not sure why they rushed to tell us without confirming first, especially for her family. It must have been difficult uh, thinking that, she, well, the announcement had been made that she died of COVID-19 later to discover that it was not COVID-19. She didn't test positive and none of her family tested positive. Both cases were in the Western Cape. Uh, so the department has been quite now intent on putting out information to kind of clarify that. They've also just given us an update. We are on 1,170 cases of COVID-19. Again, these are cases that have been tested and confirmed. It's not a reflection of how many cases there are in the country. We've had 31 recoveries, which means that it's a fairly good recovery rate. Um, and we are reporting these to the, you'll find them on the John Hopkins website or on the Worldometer, where these recoveries are being reported. And we have three people in, in, on ventilators, four in ICU and three on ventilators at the moment. And it's those cases, those critical ventilator cases, is where we find lots of deaths. So depending on how those cases go, we could have a few more deaths. So quite interesting is that the Department of Health has now started issuing a list of people who are vulnerable to COVID-19. And that includes people who smoke people with chronic illnesses, diabetes, uh, any form of lung disease, tuberculosis, people with HIV AIDS with a low CD4 count. Specifically, they've mentioned people with HIV AIDS with a low CD4 count. Because uh, if your CD4 cells, if you have a low count of CD4 cells in your body, that makes you more susceptible uh, to COVID-19. And uh, immunocompromised people, so people with conditions like lupus, they are also at risk. And quite interestingly, uh, they didn't mention hypertension, but from other websites I have read, hypertension would also uh, increase your risk. Now, for those people who have these conditions, and of course the elderly, the elderly sometimes have many of these conditions. For those people who do have these conditions, and for those people who are elderly, I think the message is quite clear that you are at risk from COVID-19. But I think this is a great chance for the government and the WHO to change the narrative around who can die from this disease. And uh, the, the WHO a week ago started focusing on young people because there is a feeling amongst young people around the world that somehow they are invincible and this is an old person's disease. And I think that needs to change and I think this is a great opportunity. And the reason why is because in South Africa, for example, we've had our first death and it's a woman under 50, yes, with an underlying condition, but those first two uh, categories is not what we've been told. Women have not died more than men anywhere in the world, or at least in, in the first sample group. And we also have not had many deaths under 50. The majority have been in, amongst older people over 80. So it means that everyone can die. And in the UK and the US, they're reporting many more cases of young people, people playing sports, 21 year olds, no history of smoking, no history of vaping, no underlying conditions, being critically ill, and even dying from COVID-19. And it's, and it's baffled a lot of uh, professionals because the way we establish what the disease can do comes from what I'm gonna call an information pack. So 
China would have had the disease first. Out of the first 49,000 cases, they would have they would have developed a profile of the virus. Um, and you have a person who's called an epidemiologist, and that's their job, so to say, is they kind of tell us what happened, who it happened to, and in what environment. So in this case, the what is the novel coronavirus, so they'll tell us if it's a if it's a pathogen, is it a virus, is it a fungus, is it a bacteria, is it a parasite? In this case, it's a virus. And then who, who does it affect? In this case, it affects us, human beings, and the environment, and where, where in the body or uh, where it came from, what, what sort of uh, difference it makes in your body. So in this case, we have a, a virus that affects human beings, and the age group has been defined. And uh, the epidemiologist... Um, is quite a, it's a term we're going to use quite a lot. So basically, as I've explained, it's a study of diseases and, in the, and they try to find the patterns and explain to us how this relates to us. And once they've determined the patterns, they then advise governments what to do uh, or what to do if we have an outbreak. So the epidemiologists would have looked at the first 49,000 cases in China and they would have then uh, worked out what sort of measures we need to put in place. But now the problem with that sample group is that the Chinese sample group of 49,000 uh, has a very different sort of variable to people around the world. So for example, uh, people in the UK or in the US are not in the same sort of sample group as the people in China in terms of maybe conditions. So there's new conditions. Like in South Africa, we have different conditions. So that particular report that would have come would not have sufficiently covered, because it's a new, it's a new disease, wouldn't have sufficiently covered all probabilities and variables. Like, for example, in our case, wouldn't have covered, there's no one in the report who had HIV AIDS. So we don't know how those diseases interact together. What they would also tell us is, and this is very important, is when they tell us we must have a travel ban or they advise the president to maybe close the borders and to uh, get social distancing in place, what they've basically worked out is uh, the reproduction rate of the virus. Now, this is represented, it's called an R naught. It's so basically an R and a small naught, and the naught is the number, and that's how quickly the rate, uh, the, the virus reproduces, the rate at which it reproduces, or more simply, it's how many people one infected person infects. So if one person infects one person, that's an R naught of one. And if one person infects two people, that's an R naught of two. So the reason why we react in the way we do to COVID-19, and some people would say, but people die of the flu all the time, and we never behave like this. More people die of the flu, and we don't behave like this. There's two or three very important reasons for that. One, we have a vaccine for influenza, um, and we have a new vaccine every year, and we don't... Uh, lose people to influenza because we don't know how to stop it. We know how to stop it um, and we have a vaccine and if you vaccine for it, it gives you a better chance. Number two is uh, the mortality rate of influenza stands at 0.01% and uh, Dr. Tony Anthony Fauci, uh, immunologist from the US, he's basically Trump's right hand man, very good doctor and uh, like a clear head in America on the, situ on the situation, he says at the modest, at their most modest estimation, COVID-19 has a mortality rate that's 10 times worse. That's one. The WHO put it at 3.4% mortality rate, but of course, all of that changes once we know exactly how many cases we have, because they take the cases and they divide that by, they take the deaths and divide it by how many cases, and that gives us our mortality rate to tell us how many people are dying from the disease. And finally, the R naught. So the R naught of flu is believed to be about 1.3, based on which uh, study or website you look at. Uh, so that means every one person that has flu, you in, you infect another person in a bit. Whereas the R naught for uh, for this disease, COVID-19, is is at a modest estimation about 2.2. So it means you infect two people at least, and those two people infect two people. So you can see the exponential growth of it. That is where the high risk comes. So an endemologist. Sorry, uh, epidemi epidemiologists will look at that and tell us exactly what we need to do to stop this growth and why it's such a high risk. I think in South Africa's case, we are now about to discover how this affects young people who are immunocompromised. 
It's very interesting. Uh, New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo, and I've been following his press conferences in particular almost daily because he does a PowerPoint presentation where he kind of tells you where they are at in America or in New York State. New York State is now the epicenter of the outbreak. They have the most cases by far. They're building makeshift hospitals. They've got the, the, the army boat parked in New York. It's been revamped. They're revamping hotels to get ready for the big influx of people they're expecting because they are about to look at their peak. They've got too many cases at the same time and they don't have the hospital capacity to deal with everyone because it's been circulating for a while. So in South Africa, the fact that we've had our first death tells us that the virus has been circulating for a while. Death is usually your measuring rod of how long your virus has been, search, has been circulating. And the lady who uh, died was diagnosed on the 23rd of March and she died on the 27th. So we know that she contracted COVID-19 before that, at least a week before that, maybe even longer, maybe a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks. And so we know that the virus is searching. And Andrew Cuomo, he expressed last week or earlier this week that the amount of young people that were coming in for testing was concerning. In fact, between the ages of, I think it's 18 and 49, they had 53% of the admissions in this age group. That's more than half of the admissions were in the 18 to 49 year, uh, year old group. And uh, I think that's a reason for us to now relook at what I'm calling the information pack that the Chinese have said to us and see how it applies to us. So the pack is accurate in the sense that it tells us who is at risk. But because there are so many more young people around the world uh, than we expected. And I think a lot of doctors around the world have been expressing they didn't expect to, to be treating this many young people. So now that they're treating this many young people, it's time for us to look at the data and to try to find within that, uh, within our own situations, where the risks, additional risks might lie. So for South Africa, one death is not enough for us to uh, decide who the disease kills. It will take us some time and some time in combating to kind of find its pattern and our epidemiologists will contribute to the conversation, the international conversation, with information telling us how it's responded to people with HIV AIDS, how it's responded to people with TB, and that will be South Africa's contribution to the world. And I think the reason for us to begin changing this narrative and to start letting people all know that you can all die from COVID-19 is because the first day of our lockdown was pretty disappointing, and I, I think a big part of it after watching a lot of the news broadcasts was that people did not understand the disease and they did not understand how this disease related to them. So it was a far off thing. It was too far away for them to, to grasp. And I'm not sure if that's a failure of the Department of Communication, government or us as individuals not helping our fellow South Africans understand what's happening. So maybe as I leave this, I want you to maybe take that away from you and say, we have a big contribution to make South Africa to the international conversation around the COVID-19 pandemic. And you have a personal uh, opportunity to educate those around you. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, enjoy your lockdown. Uh, enjoy what you're going to watch on TV and what you're going to do with your family. And I'll speak to you again tomorrow.